Thank you very much for joining us this evening, uh, Sadiq. It's a pleasure to host you uh, for the Oxford Political Review. We're broadly speaking going to talk about a series of issues or topics, really. So we're going to start with Malaysian yeah. politics and then go into the intricacies of your own career and some of your reflections there. And then sort of finally conclude with looking at the interactions between your own your own debating uh, career and also your own political vision for Malaysia. Yeah. Now, for those of us joining from the Oxford Political Review, uh, we're pleased to have uh, Sadiq, so Sadiq, the former Minister of Youth and Sports in Malaysia and a current MP in the Malaysian Parliament, uh, joining us tonight. So, Sadiq, let's just get the elephant in the room started. Yep. What do you make of the government change and the leadership change in Malaysia in February 2020? Uh, could you tell us what happened from your point of view in terms of the Sheraton move and also the subsequent days of events? Yeah, there have been a lot of discussion uh, before, but mere discussion without actual action. And the discussion revolved um, around the need to ensure that the government is stable and that no one challenges uh, the Prime Minister then, Tun Dr Mahathir, by removing him before uh, or halfway through the term uh, out of force and not uh, due to actual consent or an agreeable decision together. But um, two days before the crisis occurred, there was a presidential council meeting uh, among the uh, coalition members. And uh, surprisingly, we reached a consensus that the prime minister will still stay and remain. And we came out stronger from that meeting, you know, together with there's a great sense of togetherness. Yes, we did argue heatedly in the meeting, but in the end, we were able to pull things together to ensure that there will be a stable government. It's just unfortunately two days after, um, that there was a long discussion about the need to pull out from the government to cause a collapse of the government and to form uh, a new government with, with different coalition partners. There were many reasons used. One of the major reasons used is for Bersatu as a party, my party, to survive when we face the next election, uh, especially due to the declining in Malay support uh, due to the alleged uh, DAP. DAP is a is a is, is a multiracial but largely still chinese dominated party mm -hmm. uh, being in uh, being in the coalition um, and at that point in time we were informed that um, that our new coalition partners will stand with us in next election and at the same time seats which we have already won um, during last general election will not be contested by our new coalition partners um, so obviously i think this is me trying to summarize it very quickly um, i disagreed with it uh, the Prime Minister then to Dr Mahade disagreed with it. Mm. A few others disagreed with the move because we said that, you know, in the end, these are our coalition partners who stood by us, who fought with us together to form government. And this is the government with the democratic mandate. And yes, while we should be fearful of uh, losing the next general election, but in the end, that largely lies in the hands of the people and the voters. If the voters deem us to be a failure, then it is their absolute right to punish us in the ballot box, but let us, with, let us be punished by the ballot box, not through a different political move or maneuvering, which then uh, weakens the democratic mandate. The message which this will send to, 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 to members of parliaments in the future, leaders of democracies in the future is quite damaging. It says that if you win the election, you just need to speak to five or 10 MPs uh, to defect, and then the government will fall, a new government will be formed, and this is not a culture which uh, we want to create uh, in the long term for Malaysian democracy. What more to signal to young Democrats in Malaysia that, um, that, that, that the democratic mandate can easily be subverted uh, due to uh, political interest and, uh, and, and, and backdoor scheming, which I believe will be bad for Malaysian democracy. So this is just me summarizing things. But what's clear is that the Prime Minister then to Dr Mahade disagrees and there are those who attempt to use his name up until today saying that mm -hmm. ah, this backdoor government is endorsed by Tun Dr Mahade. The reason why it is done, it is in his name to protect him. But mm -hmm. in reality, it is not. And I think Tun Dr Mahade has came, has came out quite openly to say that. Uh, so I think that must be clear. I think that's fair because I think a question I wanted to ask actually is um, to what extent do you think Dr Mahathir's refusal to 
be clear about his secession plan or his potential handover of power to uh, Mr. Anwar uh, to blame for the indeterminacy. Because some say that had Mahathir been firmer to get going, to say either he was not going to hand over power to to Anwar or that he he gave a clear date that he was willing to stick by, then maybe that would not have allowed the likes of, say, Asmin to be as aggressive in pursuing that sort of backhanded, ah, oh, we are operating in name of Mahatya to pursue yeah. so-called uh, course of justice for the party. Understood. I think that's why we need to revert back to the presidential council of the government coalition then, Pakatan Harapan, because the decision made for Tun Dr. Mahade to be the Prime Minister and for Datuk Sri Anwar to be next was made prior to election through the Presidential Council of Pakatan Harapan. And when it was made there, it should also be finalised there as well as a governing body. So as I mentioned, the final meeting where all parties came together to discuss this sensitive issue was on Friday night. I'm also a member of the Presidential Council as the U Chief of Pakatan Harapan then. We had our arguments. And it was a heated meeting, but in the end, we came out stronger together. We did a joint press conference together saying that Pakatan Harapan will respect to Dr. Mahadeh's uh, uh, tenure as the Prime Minister, and there will no longer be attempts to sabotage or to attack him, for, for example, to demand him to become a lame duck Prime Minister, for him to name an exact date, for example. But in the end, is to respect him and to respect the decision made by Pakatan Harapan prior to election. So I thought that crystallized the discussion and the fact that it came out from the Presidential Council of Pakatan Harapan, the very same governing body which led us to win the GE, to me, uh, is the most important issue here. What went wrong between that formal declaration consensus he had and then the subsequent sort of tumultuous events that week? Because it seemed that a lot of the Malaysian public felt in many ways are cheated on by the front of unity that was there on Friday and then it was just an entire week where it was unclear where the country was going next and indeed it ended up with a uh, Maria Dean's leadership that that was something that very few folks actually had predicted uh, if you asked them say 14 days ago prior to that. It, it came by to Tan Sri Mirudin's leadership is because initially the plan was for there to be a change in government but to elevate Tun Dr Mahade as the Prime Minister. So he will still remain as the Prime Minister. And that's why the first batch of statutory declarations signed and sent mm. to the King was for Tun Dr. Mahadi to be the Prime Minister. But what these people did not foresee is for Tun Dr. Mahadi to say no. And I know these people, they've been asking many times for Tun Dr. Mahadi to accede to their demands, for there to be a change in government, but for Tun Dr. Mahadi to remain as the Prime Minister. And they themselves operate behind closed doors saying that Tun Dr. Mahadi agrees. But every single time I asked to Dr. Mahadi, when I heard about this news, he denied it many times in public, in private, even in our Supreme Council meeting, he pleaded three times saying, please do not betray the people's mandate. And that was why he made the decision to step down because he lost control of his own party. And when you lose this control, then the rightful thing to do is to step down and to test back the support in parliament, because in the end, members of parliament will be the one who will decide who ultimately holds the majority uh, support. So I think on, on, on this part, I think the fact that they didn't foresee this to happen, then they banded around Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin, who's willing to take up the mantle to lead the new government uh, and this new coalition. It's just that throughout that negotiation process, there were many promises made, as I mentioned before, process which states that this new coalition will be together entering the next election. So that was what promised to Basatu uh, and, and to the Supreme Council of Basatu. And at the same time, that for the remaining seats of Basatu, which have already won, to be uncontested by our new coalition partners. Mm -hmm. But there's been new updates, right, uh, as uh, when, when the government was formed, that AMNO, one of the biggest coalition partners, has stated that they never once agreed for this new coalition to be, to be formed and cemented and to enter the next election together. In reality, Amno stated that they're merely temporarily and they will dissolve this coalition when mm. election comes and will only form with the Islamic party called PAS. Uh, so no seats are secured and safe. So what was promised um, uh, to us uh, definitely isn't true. So uh, who's lying? I hope the Malaysian public can ask that and the media can ask that to the leaders because 
we were briefed that uh, the president of AMNO agreed, uh, the president of PAS agreed mm. uh, by our leaders, by my leader. So we are still unknown who's telling the truth and who's lying on this matter. So you mentioned a ballot box and the trust in the Malaysian people uh, for quite a few times. Now, I, I just, I'm a bit curious because you recently said you would can fight the corrupt whilst remaining in Basatu, but how could Basatu as a party that's seemingly caught in two ships, you know, one is the opposition or the opposition for now, and the other seems to be in government for now. How could this ship stand up for its constituents? And, and it just seems to me that if the election comes around, the Malaysian people uh, following your line of logic feeling in many ways betrayed by, by the event laid out in February would simply have lost faith by then in Basatu as a ship because it's a ship that sailed but may well not be sailing for long so do you not think Basatu should call it a day and that either it's high time for you know the the remaining faction Basatu you're leading to to just spearhead a new movement or instead to draw the line and say you do not associate with the Basatu in Malaysian government right now because that's not the Basato that following what you said adheres to the will of the people at the ballot box. Why should we leave the party which we co-founded together? Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin is a well-respected figure and as I mentioned in interviews before I still respect him as a as a leader as one of the co-founders of Basato. But at the same time there were many others who formed Basato, moved Basato from the start with absolutely nothing, left everything behind to Dr Mahadeh Akram Shah, myself, Datuk Sri Mukris, and these are the ones, the majority of the co-founders of Basatu are the ones who object to this move because we already foresee what is happening today, that we will be backstabbed by our new coalition partners, that in the end we will be drowned out by the politics of power and, mm. the, and, and the tussling of power which is happening today. And that's what we fear the most, but we want to send a clear signal to the Malaysian public that not all leaders in Basar consent to this. And we want to explain the real story as to what happened. But at the time, we are facing COVID, right? COVID is obviously an unprecedented uh, uh, illness upon the yes. global community. So obviously, we now at the moment, we can't go all, all politics all the while. The priority for us is still to focus in dealing and waging the war against COVID. That's why we're not discussing a lot about politics and our party election will only come most likely end of the year because it's been postponed due to COVID. So in the end, the party will be the one who decides what path they want to. And the fact that today, as the uh, as our coalition, new coalition partners have said, that this is not a government made up of parties, but this is a government made up of individuals, of a member of parliaments, which means that there is no strong party-based coalition. It's just member of parliaments. So as a consequence, my party, Basatu, has never once agreed in any Supreme Council meeting to form coalition together with AMNO Corporate International. Never once did we agree. So the fact that now is a loose government among MPs, I think that provides the opportunity for us to move forward and to find a way out of this mess. That's very reasonable because uh, if we just look at the map sort of in early March and late February, it does seem to me that there were at least sort of three factions of possible combinations. You've got, of course, the pass and also armor on one hand and then uh, the splinter faction breaking out from uh, Basato. And you've also got Basato loyal to Dr. Mahathir. And then folks that are uh, beyond that, of course, the, the largest constituent or representative there would be the DAP, but also other parties that are neither aligned with Omno Pass nor with, say, uh, Basato precisely towards it, forms of Pakistan Harapan. Given that, it seemed that Dr. Mahathir would have indeed, you know, fought tooth and claw uh, and stayed in perhaps government with the other faction, not, not the faction of our past and indeed a splinter faction. The maths might not have worked out perfectly, but as you said, you know, Sadiq, politics seems to, it's not the most important thing. Standing sort of for what is right and wrong in an absolute sense might be important in peacetime, but may not yeah. be necessarily the most important thing when a country is in crisis. So I guess this is all just a long roundabout way of me asking, don't you think that for the country, for the national interest in preventing a government that's so democratically sort of pushed into power, so his allies should really have tried to stay on instead of designing to send a message that may be very noble in that essence, but nevertheless also push the country into the hands of a thereby unelected government 
it's not sets. It's 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 truly ironic, Brian, because before this, there were many allegations hurled towards to Dr. Made that he is a dictator. But this dictator has stepped down without anyone coercing him to do so twice. Before this, and now, I think again, most recently. And he did that because he lost support within the party and therefore the majority. If he was anyone else, he could have just stayed on, consolidated power as the prime minister, set all of those who opposed him, did a complete cabinet reshuffle, and in the end, consolidate power even more. But he didn't because I think he thought, I mean, he took a while to think about it and he sent his letter of resignation willingly and even after that, still met up with leaders of Pakatan Harapan to ensure that a way forward can be forged to ensure that we will not ally ourselves with those from AMNO and PAS, especially elements you know, which have been charged with widespread corruption and global kleptocracy. So, I mean, while we can think from a, more from a Machiavellian uh, political viewpoint to do this, and the end justifies the means, but at the same time, I think he was aspiring for something better. Great, and that's actually perfect because I want to segue into your sort of personal vision and your, your conception or your vision for Malaysia. But right in the transition point, actually, because you mentioned um, a while back in our interview that you had a lot of respect for Muhyiddin. And in fact, in a previous interview, you called him, he's like a fatherly figure. But at the same time, Basato, as you've rightly pointed out, seems to be a party that is, in principle, supposed to stand for all in Malaysia against corruption. Don't you think that it, it's quite difficult for you to reconcile sort of your respect for Muhyiddin and the fact that he's currently basically forming a, a ten, sort of tentative coalition, a makeshift coalition with, uh, um, no, pass, a government that you yourself fought, fought against in a previous general election in order to kick out corruption from Malaysia. Do you not think it might be worth sort of taking a stronger stance on, on this brand of Versace politics and yeah. being more upfront really about the, the failings there? Principal disagreements in no way means that I lose respect uh, to Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin. And let's not forget that um, this is not his only political action. Prior to election, he challenged the global kleptocracy. He was fired from cabinet and from his own party when he spoke up against global kleptocracy and formed the party together with Tunok Temade and many others to ensure they were able to win the historic election. So I will never forget that and what he has done. It's just that on this matter, there is a principal disagreement. I know he believes that he can tame AMNO and PAS, that he will still send all of the AMNO corrupt behind closed doors and that he can split AMNO because he said many times that there are many factions within AMNO and he can split AMNO into a few factions and get AMNO members to join Bersatu and for Bersatu to be the biggest party and for Bersatu to be the party which rejects the corrupt elite within AMNO. So I, I know he has his own tactic, so I think we will wait and see whether it works. I hope, I wish the best for him, but at the same time, I think there must be a principal stance taken as well. Because again, Brian, I mean, I joined politics to go against the very people who now I'm forced to work with. Um, and the very same people who if in two or three months time after COVID decides to withdraw support from government, government collapse and a general election takes place, they could potentially rise up back to power. So I know that Tan Sri Muhyiddin has his tactics to divide and conquer, uh, to ensure that an AMNO faction will join him. Because remember, in Basatu, there are already 13 members of parliament who, after the general election, jump ship from AMNO to join us, who now have senior ministerial positions uh, in Tan Sri Muhyiddin's uh, mm -hmm. government. So yeah, maybe the tactic of uh, divide and conquer it can potentially work, we'll wait and see. But at the same time, as the youth leader of Basatu, it is my job to ensure that I act as a check and balance to ensure that corruption can be tackled and abuse of power will be challenged and that we come out stronger from this. Great. So let's move on to then sort of your vision for Malaysia, because I, I think you're absolutely right. It is a, Malaysia is a multi-ethnic state, yet Basatu as a party has historically repeatedly uh, attacked uh, Chinese residents living in Malaysia. So we saw this in the incident with Dong Jiaozong and Cat Calligraphy in December 2019 with the controversy on the implementation of sort of classes pertaining to Malay culture in those schools. Now we might classify that as, as a gaffe or as a one-off incident, but 
But even Dr. Mahathir's claims that foreign Chinese property owners themselves were a threat to Malaysian peace or certain radical elements of Malaysian politics branding the DAP as uh, fundamentally antithetical towards Malaysia's interests because they're allegedly anti-Malay. Now, I, I think we're, we have to be treading on a fine line here between sort of being unsympathetic towards these comments and also being excessively permissive towards interpreting them retrospectively. And you yourself yeah. have repeatedly decried racism in Malaysia, but do you think that your party lives up to the ideals that you champion? It does. Because in the end, we are still in a multiracial coalition and we build on each other's strength. And I don't think it's wrong to fight, to fight for the interests of, of a particular underprivileged community. For an example, if you look at the Bumiputra communities in Sabah, where a quarter of them are living below poverty line, where the majority of Malays at the moment have still not even had their share of 30% of the Malaysian economy. We still need to fight for the interest to ensure that education is shared equitably, that wealth is shared equitably. Because in the end, when you build great prosperity in Malaysia, you want to ensure that it can be felt by all races, not just the Malays, but to also ensure that there's equitable opportunities for all racial communities. I think that is the focus. And to break down your concerns, you said a few examples, and I want to go through one by one. Mm -hmm. For example, you said that there is a there's an attack against Chinese calligraphy. We never once attacked Chinese calligraphy. It's just about the issue of Jawi, right, which became an issue about uh, teaching Jawi uh, in schools, which I believe was a long debate. In the end, Malaysian schools should reflect the multi, multi-racial, multi-religious segment of the community. And yes, we should not force a particular religion down the throats of a person. In Islam, we are taught from the very beginning that there is no compulsion mm. in Islam. So I think Again, it's about finding that common path and that middle ground. I don't recall any of my party members saying that we should not allow for Chinese calligraphy. Heck, even during my Chinese New Year celebration, I was trained and taught how to do Chinese calligraphy in my constituency in Moa, which is a very multiracial uh, constituency. And if we were truly anti-multiracialism, I mean, we wouldn't ally ourselves with multiracial parties, especially with parties like the AP, who we paired up with entering the last historic uh, general election. Um, and to Dr. Mahdi, who became the Prime Minister for a while, I think governed for that long, uh, and governed with the support of all races, when he won two-thirds support many times. And, and even in 1998, he was saved by Chinese voters and by Chinese support when he was able to restore the Malaysian economy after the Asian financial crisis. So I think that's the first part which you mentioned. We, ne we were never against Chinese calligraphy to begin with. Mm -hmm. The second part which you mentioned is the disagreements with Dong Zong, the Chinese educationist group. And again, there I think we need to be very meticulous in assessing what was the disagreement. I mean, in Malaysia, we do allow for Chinese vernacular schools. But at the same time, we want to ensure that there is still some, that, that, that we never forget the multiracial element in Malaysia. And Tun Dr. Madi has mentioned it before. What he proposed is not to abolish Chinese schools, but it's this concept of sekolah wawasan. It's wawasan schools, where while there may be different school syllabus, but you still study in the same school compound so that you play sports together, you do activities together so that you see each other a lot more and that integration and interaction will lead to greater commonalities, which makes Malaysia one country even stronger. Look at Singapore, uh, Singapore's education system, where they don't even have uh, a different types of, 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 of schooling systems like Chinese schools, Indian schools, Malay schools, but in Malaysia we have it, we still respect it, but it's still about finding that common path, that common ground. And our disagreement with Dong Zong was when they disagreed on including just a few pages of Jawi. And even if you look at that few pages, I mean, Brian, if you don't, you cannot learn Jawi in three pages. It was merely showing symbols of Jawi in our, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in our currency, uh, in some of our uh, scriptures, to just show that it is a part of our culture. You can never, ever learn Jawi. So there was a lot of disagreements, mm. uh, sorry, misunderstandings which took place, which I believe we could have resolved together. But the end point here is that this is Malaysia. And Malaysia is for all Malaysians. You will never hear me or leaders of my party, top leaders of my party, disputing the heritage, the multiculturalism, which unite us all, because that is inherently Malaysia. That, 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 uh, that, that our unity is our strength and it's not a liability. That there's unity in diversity. And we will acknowledge that to be a strength of Malaysia, that we acknowledge our Chinese, Indian, 
Iban, Kadazan, brothers and sisters are indeed our family members. They are our brothers and sisters. That they are not subpar or suboptimal. That they're not pendatangs or uh, in English they call it um, uh, visitors, uh, yeah. as people put it. They are not. That they are Malaysians like you and me. And that while uh, we move forward, we move forward as one big family. In Chinese, we, I mean, in, in Mandarin, we used to say woman, posher, e children. In the end, we are all one big family and we are united together, stronger, to move forward as a united Malaysia. And on that note, actually, I think that vision of unity is very important. And I certainly can see the attractiveness of that. It's very, it's obviously something meritorious. But on the very future of policy, now, a lot of recent critics have noted that, A, in terms of tackling questions and concerns of redistribution to tackle economic inequality, it might actually be far more effective to adopt a race-blind but class-driven redistributive policy for two simple reasons. A, there are substantial variations and divergences between different Bumi Petro groups. You obviously have wealthier folks and those who are less wealthy, and then you have divisions within the urban and sort of the rural clusters there that also in, in turn spare more tensions. And B, it, it seems that when you give this entire policy a sort of race-attached flavour or a Malay-centric lens or point of view, that perception does nothing to building racial trust and harmony in a country. So even if its objectives are great, neither is the solvency they're targeting, the most vulnerable group, which also includes, by the way, Indians and other socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, non-Malay ethnicities, and B, it doesn't seem to contribute towards racial harmony in Malaysia. And it seems that, you know, uh, Mahathir or Visato at large has been relatively ambiguous, so they haven't been openly hostile or openly in favour of Bumi Petra policy in contrast to Omno and, and indeed Pass and Awang. But I, I do wonder, uh, Sadiq, don't you think that, in light of everything you said just then, that we are indeed in the same family, maybe it's time to set that Bumi Petra and its toxic legacy aside and let's build a better alternative proposal to that, that really does get to grips with socioeconomic inequalities without all the race-driven uh, lenses yeah. uh, and stigma attached to it. Yeah. Racial classes and socioeconomic classes are largely intertwined to one another. So let's look back Malaysia's history when we introduced the National Economic Policy by uh, Tun Abdul Razak, one of the most well-respected uh, prime ministers uh, in Malaysia. And when he came up with that policy, which is seen to be Bumiputra friendly, but if you look at the goals of the policy, it is truly good. It is to remove, it is to wipe out poverty, not just among the Malays, but among all races, to ensure that wealth is distributed more equitably. And, you know, prior to the 1970s, the economic equity held by the Malays is only at a miserable 2.7%. It was miserable, despite the fact that there were about 60 to 70% of the population. That back then, there were less than 10 Malays who will get government scholarships to go to the best of universities and that they were not even in there were not enough malay doctors heck they were they were less than five percent malay doctors who were, who made up the professional class in malaysia that was due to the nep the national economic policy when it was done right and i need to put the disclaimer there when mm. it was done right now we see that there are a lot more malay doctors malay professionals architects accountants coming up when you focus to the b40 and you zoom in particularly to, to the underprivileged Malay communities, right, who have been locked up from work, who don't live in urban areas uh, because of Malaysia's past and history. Often they, they, they traditionally do agriculture, so they have been locked out due to, ge to, 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 ge to geography, history, and many other reasons. The point is that when we acknowledge that race and socioeconomic classes are largely intertwined to one another and they interact with one another, policies must also be carved out that particular way. But I'd say the disclaimer here, when you say that there is a gap among the rich and poor Malays, I agree with you. And that's something which we need to remedy. Let's look at our ASB, Amana Saham Bumi Putra, where uh, there's a fund set up to help the Malays in general. I mean, again, it showed there that the majority of those who own wealth are those in the top 1% who are Malays. Again, it's about retuning policies. There are a lot of those who get scholarships previously who also come from well-off families. That is something which we need to correct. They are very good uh, boarding schools, which are called MRSM, which previously opened the door to many of those who come from T20 families. The Pakatan Haraban government corrected that. Again, we focused on B40 Malay families. So the point is, if they are Malays who sell contracts for short-term gains, right, we need to stop them. 
if they are Malays who are already well off but are ripping off the system at the expense of poor Malays, we have to correct it. That's why I stress again, look at not just Malays but Bumi Putra's overall. What about the Orang Asli, right? Mm. The indigenous communities who require great support. What about the Bumi Putra community in Sabah where a quarter of them are living below poverty line? What do we do to help them? So the point is, the errors and mistakes should be corrected. But that in no way means that we should completely wipe out the notion of race in Malaysia. Malaysia, as Bangsa Malaysia, should still be the priority. But at the same time, people can still associate and be proud of their cultures and ethnicities. At the same time, ensure that their community is well taken care of and we get them out from poverty and we ensure that wealth overall in Malaysia is, dis is distributed equitably among races so that everyone gets rich together, everyone gets a good job, that no one is left behind and no one is caught in that poverty trap, regardless of which race you are born into. That's fair. I think that's very noble. I just want to sort of turn your attention perhaps to a bit more about foreign affairs. So let's have a change of topic for a while. And uh, sure. some of the following questions you might have had before and might not be particularly pleasant, but I think they, they must still be asked. So sure. uh, firstly, um, on the question of Israel, now it seems that both Basato and Malaysia at large have been historically quite hostile and opposed to Israel. And usually the responses from you guys is that it's one thing to be anti-Zionist and another to be anti-Semitic. But the reality yeah. is a lot of the discourse targeting Israel as a regime or that is claimed to be only targeting the re regime, has been intermingled with and mixed with, frankly, a lot of anti-Semitic comments that draw upon, in many ways, deeply traumatizing and offensive imagery that characterize Jews in ways that are fundamentally, in, in my opinion, immoral and morally reprehensible. What do you make of Malaysia's legacy and relationship with Israel? And do you not think it's perhaps the responsibility of youth and young leaders to really step up the game and let's normalize the way we treat fellow human beings in that sense. Yeah, I want to make this clear. I'm not anti-Jewish, nor am I anti-Semitic. We're not against the race, but the actions of the democratically elected leaders of the Israeli state. And yes, I am anti-Zionism. I think that part I'll put on record. I remember being grilled about this even when I went on BBC Hard Talk. So I remember um, there was an issue which came during my administration uh, which was um, on the uh, athletes from Israel who want to come to Malaysia. And the government made a decision collectively to disallow them from coming to Malaysia and became a big global issue or international issue for Malaysia. But people forgot just a few months before that, that there were also sports teams, the football team from Palestine, who was barred to travel from Gaza to West Bank to play in their very own football league by the democratically elected Israeli government under Benjamin Netanyahu, that when Israel can police Palestinian sports teams, which Malaysia feels very strongly about, and when we return the favor, suddenly we are the international pariah. They forget that when the Israeli government, through their very own sports minister, puts immense pressure on, uh, on, 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 on the basketball association in the States, right, um, to not recognize Palestine, and they ended up not recognizing Palestine, and that is permitted and that is allowed. So the point is, Malaysia has always showed strong brotherhood to the Palestinian state, and we do recognize and do sympathize with the Palestinian plight. So our focus, again, is on the actions of the Benjamin Netanyahu's government, and especially when it was so recent and fresh that sport sanctions were placed on Palestinian sports teams and suddenly no one in the international community could speak up for them. Malaysia made the decision to speak up for them. But two wrongs presumably don't make a right, right? Because uh, the sanction logic there, and this is also just broadly a, an ethical issue with sanctions, is that you, you leave collateral costs and damages on those who are neither directly able to change decisions nor retrospectively responsible for decisions. And I don't think the Israeli athletes barred from Malaysia were responsible for their government's uh, choices towards Palestine or decisions towards Palestine. If anything, you know, it, it strikes me that a lot of the more pro most progressive and also two-state solution friendly Israelis are those that are in many ways, you know, not able to change and shape their governmental policies. And, and it just seems to be a mismatch to punish them for the decisions of their governments. And that sort of, it just strikes me as unethical in that sense. It's also not the fault of the majority of peaceful Palestinians 
um, for the actions of the few terrorists, right? It's not the fault of them, but yet actions are still taken against them. If we look in Israel, it is a democratically elected government, right? Decisions are made through a democracy and they elected Benjamin Netanyahu. But yet we don't apply the same standard to Palestine, right? Especially in areas where there is no democracy, but we punish them as a collective. So I think, again, if you want to weigh things up, we should be more sympathetic to the Palestinians. At the same time, it's about also weighing things out. In the end, the Israeli athletes could still play uh, or, or could still uh, um, uh, uh, represent the country in a different country. They went, I think, in the end, uh, not Malaysia, but to a different uh, host nation. And they could still do so. But Malaysia, as a country which feels very passionately about Palestine, I'm not just talking about the leaders, the Malaysian electorate, the Malaysian people feel very strongly about Palestine. If we don't send a signal, if we don't try to defend them, who else will? So I think on this issue, it's about finding that common path, that common ground, or at least that moderate stance, right? Because obviously, as you mentioned, I mean, two evils don't make a right. But in the end, we are sending a positive signal that we will stand with Palestine, that we are here to defend them, that if the Israeli state elected again by the people could punish Palestinian athletes, right? Why? And, and no one dared to speak on behalf of them. Malaysia will speak on behalf of them. And I'm only talking about sports now. I haven't talked about the atrocities committed by the Netanyahu government. Again, now even pursued in the International Criminal Court. Atrocities committed during CASLED, uh, Operation Protective Age, Pillars of Defense, where hundreds if not thousands of innocent Palestinians were maimed, scarred, murdered in cold blood. I mean, if we start going down that path, that, that discussion will be even longer. But let's look from the sports angle, sports diplomacy. That was the stance taken not by me only, but by the Malaysian government overall, which represents the collective consciousness of the Malaysian people. And that was the decision which we stood by. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up this section very quickly. But just by that logic, though, doesn't that mean that if I were hypothetically to hold the rest of Malaysia accountable for the actions of the current sort of mismatch coalition that's in, in charge of Malaysian politics, so you look at, indeed, the coalition between Omno Pass and a, a, a section of Basatu, and I could argue that Malaysia is also a democracy, that therefore the Malaysian people ought to bear the consequences of whatever that government decides to do. Would, would you say that's a fair sort of moral burden imposed upon them? The last time Malaysia went to the ballot box was almost two years ago. The last time uh, Israelis went to the ballot box, I think, was a few months ago. Heck, they've been going through ballot boxes so many times. So they've exercised their democratic right many times, right? And they could choose. So I think the context here is very different, um, especially when the change in government came in the very last minute, you know, it wasn't through a ballot box in comparison to what happened uh, in Israel. But even then in Malaysia, while we didn't go through the ballot box again, these are still elected members of representatives. And that's why at the moment, we are not disputing the legality of this new government. They, they are indeed constitutionally legal. But we are looking at the morality of the new government. We are looking at the way to move forward to ensure that Malaysian democracy will be stronger after this, not weaker. Great. And let's talk about Malaysian democracy and COVID-19 then, because that seems to be the elephant in the room. What do you make of the government's response as a whole? And do you have any particular qualms or objections to it? Yeah. I mean, as I mean, I've, I've come up with a statement before. I think this is a time to come together. While there will be criticisms, the criticisms must be constructive. And we should not try to beat the government down now when they are facing the crisis. And I say this despite the fact that it's quite painful because we were, I mean, the change in government took place during COVID as well. But I don't want to punish the government like how, they, how the same people punished us before. Um, so I think moving forward is about coming together and fighting this war together. Again, this war cannot be won by a government. It can only be won when the 30 million Malaysians come together, work together, adhere by social distance rules, uh, stay at home, stay safe, stay healthy, you know, and only then can we win this war together. And we are about to win. I mean, the fact that now there are more people uh, for the past week, I think, or almost the past week, there have been more recoveries than those who are infected by COVID. I think it's a very good sign. And, 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 and the credit should largely go to the uh, uh, Director General of the Ministry of Health, who's done an exceptional job, a civil servant, a top civil servant, and the whole team under the Ministry of Health and especially to the Malaysian people who have fought by 
uh, who have fought the, 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 the COVID virus together as one. Um, so I know you might be expecting me to be criticizing here and there, and I have my criticisms, of course, especially the double standardness when it comes to punishing those who, who, who flout the laws when it comes to MTO rules. Um, you know, there have been cases where, um, I mean, a youth who merely sent a cake to another friend gets jailed for six to seven days. But um, uh, ministers, uh, ministers is now scot-free despite the fact mm. openly flouting MCO rules. Uh, and the deputy minister in the end only getting a 1,000 ringgit fine uh, and can go through the court process, but yet this youth automatically gets uh, imprisoned for seven days. Um, so I think while there may be arguments about double standardness, but again, I think the priority is about dealing with COVID properly as one. And um, I think that will be my priority and I believe should be the priority of all members of parliament. I really admire the fact that you donated your entire salary for the previous month to provide for those who need COVID-19 related support in more uh, your, your constituency. But yeah, I was yeah. just wondering, what, what's the long game here? Because it seems to me that uh, given that Basatu's funding, or rather the sort of parliamentary allocation, did in fact include, exclude your constituency, um, what, what's going to be the long game in terms of helping your constituency here? Because it's not, it, it, you might be in trouble, I'm suggesting. <laughs> That, that's where it takes a lot of diplomacy. I think as a member of parliament, I believe strongly to working with everyone when it comes to securing funds to help my constituents. And if all else fails, is to look for funds from private sectors to donate. And I'm quite privileged because especially during this time of COVID, there have been many private sector individuals who have uh, come to the front to help us out. I mean, from small donations to 50 to 100 ringgit to donations to 1,000 ringgit to 10,000 ringgit, and they're coming up to help out and, and, and in, in, in a very meaningful way. Um, but I believe that there was a missed opportunity um, for the previous government, which I was a part of. Mm. Um, while we did increase allocations for opposition constituencies, back then it was zero, uh, we did give them uh, a good allocation, but it wasn't equal, right? I think we should have made it equal. If it was equal, then I think there will not be this issue about you being a member of a member of parliament in government or opposition. In the end, it should be fair and it should be fair for all. Um, so I think there was a missed opportunity. Moving forward, I think we need to find a way to correct that. Um, while it will not be perfect, it may be gradual, like what we did before, from zero, from nothing to at least something. But um, we need to keep on pushing forward because in the end, no member of parliament should ever be held ransom. Um, uh, uh, by, by starving them of their constituency fund because it's not for them but it's for the underprivileged in their respective constituencies. Uh, I'm still privileged, I have to point this out because I could reach out to Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin, the Prime Minister mm. of Malaysia. I spoke to him, I, I wrote a letter to him to request for additional funds and he did approve, he did end up approving additional funds to deal with COVID. What happens after, God knows, but the point is um, it, we need to keep on engaging uh, with all leaders when it comes to helping uh, our constituencies. How do you reckon COVID-19 would affect Malaysia's relationship with China? Because it seems that there is indeed a lot of increasing backlash to uh, the, the Chinese government in light of what's happened. Uh, and yet, at the same time, given Malaysia is a multi-ethnic state with a very large Chinese population, there's bound to be rising xenophobia and antagonism towards Chinese members in Malaysia. What can we do, or what can you do, to, uh, as, as a collective, rather, to secure the interests of the Chinese folks in Malaysia? Yeah. I think first thing first is to separate. I think Malaysian Chinese mm. are Malaysians. They are viciously loyal to Malaysia, and a lot of my Chinese friends will say that Malaysia is a motherland, not China. Mm. Um, so I think it's to separate the two issues. But when we look at China as a country, um, I think Malaysia has always had warm ties with China, regardless of which government uh, is in power. Uh, when the Pakatan Harapan government uh, took power, while people thought that we'll sever ties with China, we didn't. But what we did, we were one of the only successful democracies which renegotiated uh, shady deals made by the previous government with China, like on ECRL, the East Coast Railway mm. Link, which initially was priced at almost 66 billion. We saved up at about 21 billion ringgit when we renegotiated the deal with China and many, many other deals, you know, like the pipeline deal in which we already paid almost 80% of the funds, but, the, but there was no progress or not much progress uh, on, on, on the pipeline and, and many other deals. 
the point is we talk to them they are still our partner and um it's tough for any southeast asian countries to survive without having good relationships uh, with 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 uh, huge economies like china so the point is we work together and even in this uh, tough time of covid i think china has been uh giving the helping hand where it's through giving face masks sanitizers um sending down their trained professionals to help us out because mm. we did the same when china was the epicenter you know we we uh, we 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 donated uh, in terms of uh, in kind to the chinese people to help them out because malaysia uh, uh, has uh, one of the largest mm. um, um producers of um hand gloves uh, which the chinese people need um so when we help one another out when we are in need they will help us and when they are in need we will help them in the smallest of ways but it's symbolic to show that our ties will remain strong that that's very noble of you and i just want to loop back i guess to sort of your domestic vision for malaysia as we sort of trend towards the future and we set aside the present and past so uh my first question is on questions of sexual minorities on equal representation and gender relations and dynamics yes malaysia seems to be uh, a conservative society but at the same time you know you you are someone who has said that you champion progressive ideals and values and you you would want to go to continue to doing so in the future Do you think you've done enough on the front of LGBTQ rights and do you think there are certain failures that you you would want to reckon with and really just improve upon from this point onwards? There are certain values which the Malaysian people I'm not just talking about one community the multiracial multireligious Malaysian community hold dearly to themselves. Um and as you know in all democracies often the I mean democracies must reflect the collective consciousness of the people. Um and these are issues in which Malaysians prefer to hold dearly to themselves. Um even in countries like Singapore, right? They don't tread on these issues because at times the backlash could potentially be far far worse when these issues are dealt with. So I think moving forward is about finding that moderate path. Malaysia always believes in moderation in Islam we call it wasatiyah. Um So it's about finding that moderate path to move forward and to ensure that in the end we grow stronger as a country. But, okay, th- that that is fair. Or I would push back against the claim that you know in democracy you have to reflect the majority will, because of course you in democracy you reflect the public will, the general interest. But just yeah. from purely philosophical point of view, you know, the majority's will is not the only constituent of that. Sometimes that's why we have counter-majoritarian checks and balances. We have constitutional courts and. we have judiciary interpretations that explicitly sometimes have to go against the majority will sure. and as opposed to push back there is it, by definition minority rights would not you know aggrandize themselves or make themselves uh, fundamentally appreciated by the majority and it's very hard to get that through when there's perceived antithetical conflict yeah. sure what you draw the line between acceptable majoritarianism and unacceptable mm. majoritarianism or do you think that line should never be drawn and we should always adhere to the will of the majority No of course not. I think again there are basic principles in which we need to guard and protect, right? So I think our federal constitution is quite all encompassing on this. That's why in the end whenever there are disputes like this we fall back towards our federal constitution and I can tell you the vast majority of Malaysians uh uh, uh love the federal constitution and adhere by it. And at the same time the way in which we find a common ground or at least a middle ground is in how we address these sensitive issues. So let's look at how we deal with the transgender community. You know, while some may choose to push them to a corner in which then they are trapped and are forced to deal with prostitution and a life of sexual exploitation, um but there's another path in which for example one of the most popular ustaz in Malaysia, a a a a a religious preacher called uh, Ustaz Abid Liu, when he go when he goes to meet up with the transgender community, he doesn't preach hate. He doesn't hit them or beat them up but he preaches compassion he preaches them to come back he preaches uh, he he helps them economically to ensure that they have a livelihood so there are different ways in which we approach it but at the same time we need to ensure that we don't breach the federal constitution we ensure that we still deal with the collective consciousness consciousness of the Malaysian people in how we move forward it's a tough and sensitive issue but i think as long as we use compassion uh, i think there's a way to move forward
And beyond compassion, what would be your sort of personal vision as to your, what you personally can do to drive this progressive vision forward? Because you know, you, you're, you're a very well-respected voice amongst the young political community in Malaysia, and you're clearly a very important voice in the Malaysian political community at large. So what are your plans on that front uh, in terms of the progressivism or your vision for progressivism in Malaysia as you always spearheaded? What are you going to do in the upcoming few years? at least in the run-up to the next election, which I'm sure after which you'll still play a very prominent role in whatever capacity. Yeah, I think in the end it's about adhering to the federal constitution, and the federal constitution never once endorsed violence or coercion. Um, and at the same time, we the best way is to use compassion. There are a lot of examples in which how we address these communities by using compassion, by talking to them, engaging in dialogue with them. And again, Ustaz Abit Liu is one personality uh, which has done this amazingly in Malaysia through engagement, through support and compassion. And uh, besides, I think moving forward, it's not just to look at this kind of issues. Again, it's about addressing multiracialism in Malaysia overall. It's about dealing with the uh, weak democratic institutions which can be strengthened. I mean, my government or previous government we were in the process of tightening political funding laws in Malaysia. It was completed. It was about to be tabled in parliament. I really hope that this new government will do so because if they don't, then political corruption will never die in Malaysia because young idealists like me will lose in party elections because when, fun, when, when, when money dominates everything else. And that's why I'm really hoping that this law will be tabled because I was one of the key proponents who pushed for this, discussed this in cabinet, got it agreed, and now it's time to table it and to move forward is to ensure that the Malaysian Anti-Corruption uh, Commission is placed under the parliament and not under the Prime Minister's office. And again, this has been agreed in cabinet and we were about to table it uh, in parliament to do this. And again, I hope this new government will do so. It, overall, it's about strengthening Malaysian democratic institutions because when these democratic institutions are strong, that while governments change, politicians change, I will lose uh, and and, and uh, I will lose an election at one point in time. I will be in government, I will be out of government, but as long as democratic institutions and democratic traditions are strong, that while there may be changes in government and personalities change, but the institutions will forever remain strong and that the interests of the Malaysian people will forever be safeguarded. So I think that is the way in which we need to move forward. So there are a lot of things. We need to look at how we deal with the federal constitution in safeguarding it, we need, to ensure, we need to ensure that we deal with poverty, not just abject poverty, but subjective poverty among races and in, uh, intra-races. We need to look at how we deal with youth representation, which, which I feel personally very passionate about. And that's why uh, in one year time, we were able to make three major constitutional amendments, which empowered more than 7.8 million young voters like never before, which will be a political earthquake for the next election. So again, I think when we piece all of this together, while strengthening democratic institutions, I think Malaysia will be in safe hands, whoever rules. Because again, I think from last election to the elections to come, there will never be a government who can rule for decades. Governments will change. People will be the determinant. They are the strongest. It's about ensuring that the rakyat and the people are the ones who are in control of Malaysia, not the minority, not a few elites. And I think that's the future which uh, we want to bring Malaysia up together. And on that question of youth, actually, I just wanted to ask, because this is a question that came up in the live stream section as well. What is your biggest regret as youth and sports minister? What is something that you wish you'd done more, but never got the opportunity to? And what would that one thing be, really? Jobs. Jobs, jobs and jobs. I mean, because dealing with jobs takes time, right? So... We spent, I mean, it took a while for us to craft a policy which will create about 300,000 quality jobs in Malaysia. It's called Malaysia at Work. And um, I think we were able to secure about 6.5 billion worth of funding for this program. And we got it in the 2020 budget. But um, right before it was going to be executed, it was supposed to be executed in April. Then there was a change in government. I'll show one more example. Um, which also link back to jobs, which is on education loans. Um, again, one of our manifesto promise was to only start 
the repayment of education loans when a person reaches the uh, salary of 4,000 ringgit a month. Again, after long debates and discussions, we brought it up in cabinet. Cabinet collectively agreed, including Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin, Datuk Sri Azmin, Datuk Saifuddin Abdullah, Zurai who are ministers of this current government. We agreed, and it was just about to be executed. And again, due to the change, I'm not sure what status uh, it is. Again, if there's any media who's looking, uh, who's listening to this, they can fact check me. They can ask Datuk Sri Azmin, they can ask Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin. Uh, cabinet ministers then, who are cabinet ministers today, this was discussed in cabinet, agreed, the money has been set aside. So there are some regrets, like we are about to execute it, like only 18, right? Um, reducing the voting age to 18 years old. Again, we've passed it in parliament. It was the first time in Malaysia's history that we got bipartisan support for such a major constitutional amendment. We took a long, uh, I mean, it, was, it took a while to negotiate with them, but finally we reached it. And, 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 and to me, it was a learning journey for me as well to speak to all the opposition members to get them on board. And they've been great as well, which shows that bipartisanship bipartisanship is the future in Malaysia. But the execution will most likely come next year. I want to ensure that the execution is good. But again, we are privileged because we have an independent election commission. I mean, again, we put in a great person. He's called Art Harun. He's well respected by both sides. So I faith that he will be able to execute it well. So, I mean, there are some parts which I regret because it takes time, you know, I mean, for you to create quality jobs, for you to ensure that democratic institutions are strong, for you to ensure that more young people are given rightful positions. You know, we started the trend of appointing more young leaders on government-linked companies, on statutory bodies to lead them. You know, for the very first time, we had um, 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 a Jalil, uh, who's I think in his mid-30s, who leads uh, PNB. I think under PNB, is, I think it has like 800 billion ringgit. Is led by a person who's in his mid-30s. Uh, we have board members made up of young people. Uh, for example, in Sepang International Circuit, there's someone as young as 25 to 26 uh, years old. And that has taken place. We've made many youth appointments. And I hope that that trend will continue because, again, we should stop treating young leaders as only leaders of tomorrow, but acknowledge their role, which they can play today. Because the last thing which I want is for me to be treated as a token. You know, ah, Sadiq mm -hmm. was made a minister at 25 years old, and therefore youth representation is enough. It's never enough. We want yeah. more young people. Uh, and before we move on to the closing section of our interview today, I just have a quick sort of, uh, a, but a very important question um, also coming out from the live live feed, which is, uh, do you think you owe an apology to your, your former aide, uh, Numan Afifi, who, who has been bullied uh, out of the office uh, for in many ways being seen or being seen as just fundamentally not defended by, by, by you at times when uh, they were most vulnerable. And in many ways, that, that undercuts, surely, the message of representation you're trying to send out here. What do you make of the entire incident? Yeah. It was a tough time then, and Noman Afifi is a friend, right? He helped out a lot, and I respect, fit, I respect him for who he is. And what a lot of people don't know is that the decision which was made was a collective one. Uh, we discussed together, I think, to uh, know about this in depth. I think people can contact him personally. Uh, to know of this issue, uh, because it's better to hear it from him. Okay. Now, you were an R or a competitive debater. Uh, how has that changed or affected your career and conviction? It, it really played a big role in pushing me into politics. I mean, one of the reasons why I got into politics was when um, the previous government uh, banned me from teaching uh, debates in my very own university and also punished my students by barring them to represent the university mm. for my role. Um, I think that definitely pushed me in. At the same time, I remember Brian, you are debating as well. You know that there's always great idealism. You know, you discuss about so many things. You discuss about policies. You discuss about, about, about geopolitics. But then it's only within the confine of the debate room. And when the debate tournament ends, you still want to channel that idealism somewhere. I think the beauty of politics and public policies that you are able to translate that idealism into concrete policies. And that's why when I feel very strong about youth representation, when I'm a minister, 
I'm able to reduce voting age to 18 years old, which empowers 7.8 million new voters, which means that the next election, young people will be the kingmakers. You know, when I feel very strongly about dealing with corruption, that means when I'm a minister, um, it's about working very closely with the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission by placing an officer in my office, by declaring my assets, by assuring that I strictly follow by the tender process, which is an open tender process, where finally my ministry's, uh, my ministry's integrity ranking improved quite significantly. And the risk prone, uh, the, the, the corruption risk prone nature of the ministry was reduced to a great extent. So it's about translating well. When I believe in dealing with political corruption, I mean, besides looking at individuals, it's about reforming the system. And we work very closely with MACC, in particular GIACC, under the great leader of Tan Sri Abu Qasim, to come up with a new political funding framework to ensure that political corruption can be dealt with, that, so that money enters the party's account, uh, to ensure that there is a fundraising network in which you can use, but which is transparent and declared. So the point is, it's about reforming the system so that whoever comes into power uh, will not be able to abuse power because there are strong democratic checks in place to move us forward uh, uh, together. Uh, and now you said that debaters tend to be idealistic and indeed filled to the brim with uh, compassion and ambitions to change the world. Do you think that entering into politics has forced you to give up on some of the particular principal commitments that you might have held in the past? And, and how do you reconcile or justify or make these difficult decisions, really? Because that seems to be, in many ways, what politics has pushed a lot of people into inevitably yeah. committing to in terms of these choices. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a big difference between the debate fantasy land and uh, the real world, especially politics uh, in Southeast Asia and in... in, 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 in uh, traditional conservative uh, communities in Malaysia. Sometimes people want for us to be exactly the same as the West. Uh, we are not, fortunately and unfortunately. We have our own characteristics. It's about finding our way to move forward and to mitigate whatever harms exist out there and to, again, find that middle ground in a country like Malaysia. Mm. Um, so as a debater, it's about finding that middle ground between our idealism and pragmatism. What can we do? How do we do it? What is the gradual way to move forward? Uh, as you can't just, you know, shock the system and in the end, lose it completely. Um, so I think it's about finding that common ground. Uh, it will not be easy, but I believe uh, when we start engaging with more communities, talking to them, creating uh, greater awareness, empowering democratic institutions so that no voices are left behind and that we have more engagement so that yeah, uh, voices of specific communities will not be sidelined, I think that's the way forward uh, for Malaysia. And how have your friends in debating or are taken to your political career decisions and how do you feel about their reactions in that sense? It's been a very interesting reaction. I still do keep in touch with almost uh, all of them. Some agree, some don't, uh, but I respect their views. Again, um, uh, debaters will be debaters. Um, and um, obviously we all dream for the debate fantasy land. Uh, I think we all have our own problems in our own countries. Um, I mean, you have to go far, you look at the United States and you have Trump. And when I look at Trump, I'm very glad being a Malaysian because no matter what is happening here, I still think we are much, much better off uh, than the United States uh, under Trump. So you know, we all have our own sets of problems and our own sets of, uh, uh, of, 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 of assets, you know, our own cultural assets. So yeah, I just hope that our relationship will continue no matter what. And finally, the final question for today is, uh, what are your plans for the future? And where will we be seeing you sort of, uh, in 10 years' time, maybe? Mm. Um, I still think I'll be a public servant. Um, because to me, politics is about, uh, not just about public advocacy, but it's about serving my constituent. Um, where I'll be in 10 years, only God knows. I mean, um, I think Malaysian politics is very exciting and interesting, as you can witness. I mean, it changes quickly and unexpectedly, um, but I will continue my path. I will speak my mind no matter how painful and difficult it gets. Um, and at the same time, I really do want to see more and more young people climb up. I mean, one of the reasons why we are in this mess to begin with is because we're still trapped in the politics of the past, right? In uh, personality clashes of the past. Mm -hmm. But young politicians, not just me, but many young politicians from all parties are trapped. We have great people in in government and in opposition who are young. We have great leaders in UMNO 
people like Shahrul Hamdan, we have great people in past, uh, like uh, Saudara Shahe, which is a political secretary to the president of past. We have great people in my party, in PKR, in Amana, who are young. But unfortunately, we are still caught and trapped in the political struggles of the past. And one thing which I really do hope is that we will be able to move forward from the struggles and the political trappings of the past. I mean, that's why, I mean, despite the fact that some might be, some might be quite pessimistic of, of Malaysian future, I'm not because I'm looking at the new generation. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about leaders of other parties as well. That we may have our principal disagreements, but we're not vicious against one another. That we will debate heatedly with one another, but in the end, we know that, that we are all uh, loving Malaysians, you know, that we respect one another. And I see that that will be the future. Great. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It was a pleasure to have you and it was a very exciting conversation. I think we touched upon a wide range of topics, uh, some might say uh, almost as if we were in a debate ourselves. So uh, thank you, thank Brian. You